Hello, podcast listeners. Back in June of 2017, I had the pleasure of hosting a screening of a film called Lift. And after that screening, I was able to do a question and answer session with Karner Armstrong Sanfrey, today's guest, as well as a couple actors from his film. If you would like to see that interview with them, I will post a link to it in the show notes for this episode. Welcome to Diary of an Unemployed Actor with me, Milo Dennison. Today I am joined by director and acting instructor, Karner Armstrong Sanfri. Is that is that a good way of introducing you, like actor? Hey, you can call me whatever you want, Milo. How are you? Direct, director, teacher, director, teacher, yeah, instructor director, of teacher. all. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> all right. Um, well, thanks for coming on the show and taking the time to talk to me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's start by talking about your film Lift, which I saw, was it three years ago? Maybe by this point, I think. Oh, five, 50 years ago. Yeah. It seems like it's been a while, um, but it's done really well. It's won a few awards. People can watch it online. And uh, so let's talk about the film a little bit. And then we'll talk about your, um, this is uh, uh, acting or teaching. Why do I keep saying acting? Teaching. Oh, teaching, acting. Yeah. yeah. Teaching, acting. Teaching acting to teach to students. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> film first. Uh, so, uh, Lyft, it basically, for my American audience, by the way, a Lyft is an elevator. And, Very good. <laughs> and um, basically, the majority of the film takes place in a Lyft. Yeah. Uh, well, it starts in an office building, um, kind of a high collar office building on a Friday night. The last few workers are there finishing up. And uh, there's five of them in the Lyft. And the security guard is going around locking up the last few rooms. And he gets attacked from behind by a young ca- young man with a bat. And he knocks him to the ground. And he has a sudden moment, a sudden moment of regret. He runs to the lift, gets into the lift where our other five characters are. And the security guard, with his last piece of energy, turns off the power to the lift and then falls unconscious before he can call the police. So... That's how we get our six characters trapped in the lift. And then it's about their time together, di- their character dynamics, um, the backstory of our main character, Sean, um, what led him up to that attack. And then it goes from there. Um, when you were making the film, you shot it in like a warehouse, but the lift itself had kind of removable walls and that kind of stuff. Is that correct? Yeah, it was in... Um... Delight Studios, which is basically a converted warehouse in the city center of Dublin. And uh, yeah, and we built the set because we thought it'd be too difficult to shoot in a real lift. So we built the set so the walls could be moved uh, and the roof could come off and it could be lit properly. And then we shot on location in the cable building, uh, all the office stuff, uh, and we shot them coming in and out of the lift. So uh, through, through the wonders of Edison, it all looks like it's in the one place. But um, yeah, it was done with a set. So yeah, how how many days did you spend shooting that? The uh, all the scenes in the lift, the interior of the lift, we kind of rehearsed them like a play. So the actors were very, you know, ready to go. So we would shoot them in like twenty minute segments, which is you know very rare on a film set. So we'd get the wide shot of the first scene, which would run for about twenty pages. Uh, so. All the wide shots of all the scenes were done on one day. And then all the mid shots, close ups were done the second day. So all the lift scenes were shot in two days, just mm-hmm. just two 12 hour days. And then we had another eight days for the exteriors. And that's because uh, obviously you're paying rent to the studio for the shooting in the studio. Uh, time, I think so. I, I think, yeah, I think I told you the story of it. the day before we're putting up the lift in another venue which was a converted, uh, it used to be a fire station in Rathmines. Um, and I, I went over to have a look at the set. Um, oh, this was about three o'clock. And they couldn't get the set into the building. So the set, um, see, we thought the set would come apart more. And it was being built down in the country. And it was being transported up the day before filming. So um, it wouldn't fit in the building. 
So some of us were there, some of the production crew were there, and some of them were just trying to decide, okay, will we try and break it up? And the set set designer was like, no, we can't do that. Um, and then there was another room in the front of the building with, which had a bigger entrance that we that we could get it in. So we were, we had someone else on the phone to the manager of the building who wasn't there that day. Uh, oh, would you mind if we use the front room? But then thankfully we had our sound person there who was like, oh, you're, it, we're on a main road. You're going to have to ADR every single scene. Uh, and I was like, okay, we can't do that. We, we can ADR, you know, ADR is very difficult. We can't ADR 70% of the film. And then we had another person suggesting, oh, we could, we could muffle out the sound. So this was going, uh, while I was on the phone trying to get somewhere else, so this was going on for about an hour and a half. We thought, okay, we'd get a school hall or something. But being a Friday, nobody was answering their phones. Uh, and everyone was, you know, going off for the weekend. Um, so at about 4.30, we got a new venue. So we packed the van, went out to the venue, and they were putting up the set till 2 in the morning. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's those uh, emer- last-minute emergencies that you sometimes come up with. So the fire, because you said it was a fire, a former fire station engine station yeah. so the the large fire station doors we were the big through. ones that you were talking about but since they were on the street the sound person was like hey look we can't shoot here i mean we're gonna exactly get this and we were supposed to be using the back the back room but the back room had its own separate entrance which was too small <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> i don't know who to blame for that like do you blame the set person the the producer the the uh, the, the location manager Everybody has to take some blame for that one. Yeah, that's uh, blame them all. Blame them all. Yeah, but, uh... yeah, yeah. Including myself <laughs> as a producer. So we all, we all just. But we got this other venue, which was really expensive, but we got it done. So. Yeah, that's nice. How did you fund the film? Uh, no, it was a self-funded, uh, independent feature. Um, I did do one of those online campaigns, which raised about five thousand, and then I put the rest of the money in. Okay. I was on so I was on the dole. I was on the dole at the time, so I just saved up for years. Um, that's a productive use of the government's money. So, oh well, well, I think so. I liked the film. I thought it was great. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, having seen it, I can vouch for it. Have you? Because uh, I know you've you're distributing the film now, right? You people can uh, watch it. Where where can people watch it? Yeah, well, it was it was picked up a couple of years ago by um, Candy Factory Films who then got acquired. So it got delayed a bit because we, it, that was summer 2017. And, it, and that company was being in, in the process then of, about a month later of being taken over by a bigger company, uh, Screen Media Ventures. So that delayed the release of the film until everything had been moved over to the new company. Um, and they released it in America first and then Ireland just recently. So it's available on Amazon Prime for streaming. And you can get a free subscription for that if you're not on that. Okay. And then you can buy it or rent it on Google Play, iTunes, YouTube, uh, Microsoft Store. It's on Xbox as well uh, for the young people. Um, <laughs> and uh, various other places. All Pretty right. much every VOD platform. And it's streaming on Prime. And did you, have you made your money back then? Oh, God, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's yeah. No. <laughs> no <laughs> it, for the it, love you know, of the art, I guess, is what it's for, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I would like to make the money back, but uh, <laughs> it, it hasn't yet. Um, it's it, it's it's really hard um, I, to make money. I, I, I know over there in America, though, uh, a lot of people do buy films and do rent films on those platforms. But here in Ireland, it's not really done yet. So uh, I'm not sure about the UK, where you're based. Uh, it's a little of both, I guess. Um, yeah, but I mean, I have a, a decent sized U S audience for this, uh, small little podcast. So all my American listeners out there go spend a, spend a few bucks and uh, yeah. watch, help Connor out. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> uh, or just watch it for free on prime. Yeah, there you go. I mean, most everybody has a prime subscription nowadays. Yeah. I, and what's great for here in Ireland, um, is, uh, Aircom was run this promotion just over Christmas. Uh, where you get Prime for free if you sign up. So a lot of people are on Prime. So, uh, and if you're not, hey, sign up for the seven-day free trial and 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> Log out. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about that. So the, I, the, you may this might be more of a question for the distributors of the film. Uh, so I don't know how you if you'd know for sure. But how does that work? Selling a film to Amazon Prime is it just a, like a lump sum, or do you get like a percentage every time it's streamed? Do you know how that works? It's a percentage of every time it's streamed. Okay. But uh, but the percentages keep changing, <laughs> um, and I think if few years ago i think they were better percentages i think now they're really tightening up and hence why it hasn't made profit yet it's very hard it needs to be watched a lot to make anything uh, like like youtube sure like you, you have a youtube sta- you know, channel uh, you need to get a lot of hits before you can monetize so it's the same you know five cent per hour or something you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you need that huge add up. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to give up the day job. No. <laughs> yes. Nice. A uh, couple more questions about this. Uh, one: How did you find the distributor? Was it showing at a festival and they came to you? Did you reach out to them? Like, uh, how'd that work? Yeah, I, I mean, I did screen in some American festivals, but I just, I just contacted them. I, I did up a list, um, probably about thirty or forty distributors in Ireland, UK, and America, and. Um, in fairness, I, I actually I actually thought, OK, I won't hear from any of them. I'm going to have to phone them and be more persistent. But in fairness, probably 90 percent of them got back saying, yeah, send us the link um, to watch it. And then of them, uh, only a few of them came back and the Candy Factory films were the most enthusiastic. They loved the film. And I think I think what's interesting is these places probably get hundreds of links a week. Uh, do they watch them? That's questionable. But I think what I was able to do was with Candy Factory, which I couldn't do with any of the others, was I said one of the previous films they had taken on was an Irish film. And I knew the two lads who were the director and DLP on that. Not particularly well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I name dropped them in the email. I was like, oh, I see you've done. Um, I see you've had good success with such and such. I, I, you know, I'm good friends with such and such. So maybe you'd be interested in checking out this film. I think just that, just that small thing of naming somebody that they had already worked with got them to watch the film. And then the film has to stand on its own and they have to like the film. But I think just that small thing of throwing that name in perked their interest and got them to actually watch the film. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good advice of looking and seeing like what else have they, who else have they worked with? and see if there's like some kind of an association because it makes sense. Do you find the fact that you're an acting teacher makes you a better director? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, you know, diff- directors work in different ways. Um, some directors are more technical. They care more about the what lens they're shooting on or if they're shooting 4K or 20K or whatever. Um, <laughs> so, 5,000K. Really, yeah, yeah. Um, even though cinema's going to project 2K, which is what we shot on. Uh, but for me, for me, it's always about the actors and the script. So um, I've done some acting myself when I was young. Um, so I've always been a kind of actor's director. So that's where I'm comfortable, you know. So, yeah, I, I, my, my whole job is working with actors. So... Mm-hmm. I love it. And and then I, I'm getting better at the technical side. But, you know, I, I have people who focus on the technical side. But I am learning more about the technical side. But I was always, since I was seven, I was always involved in acting. So that's, I think, where my strength is. Yeah, it makes sense. If you've got a good crew, if you've got a good DOP and, and AD and, you know, who, that you can just be like, look, this is what I want. And then they can go do it without you needing to kind of hover over their shoulders and focus spend your time with the actors that's nice yeah uh, we, we worked in, a, in an interesting way on lift i don't know if you've seen this on a set before but but what i would do with the dlp was i mean i did a shot list beforehand and stuff to get really just for scheduling wise but what we did was he, he would just come in and say okay let's just run the scene so i'd run the scene with the actors and then he'd suggest okay this is the type of shot we should do this is you know and i found that a really kind of exciting kind of way of doing it and it worked out really well it didn't work you know it didn't work for the days in the lift which needed to be structured and that's why the first couple of lift scenes in my view don't look great they get better as we go along because we're further into the shoot because we shot it in sequence but the first lift scene so 
And unfortunately, that's in the first 10 minutes of the film. So if you stick with it, 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 it looks a lot better in the, after about 10 minutes. But um, apart from that, it was a really interesting way of doing it. I don't know if you've ever... Have you no, ever I haven't, that? actually. It, may, it kind of makes sense uh, because you're, you're running it and then why your DP's uh, watching it, they're, I, would, I mean, this is the way I would do it if I was DPing a film, is then I would be literally thinking of like the best way to get the shots and tell that story visually as well by watching what's happening on the thing. Because if you come in there before, if you try to do that before, you don't fully know where the actors will be moving or where they'll be looking or kind of what the director wants and that kind of stuff. So it it does kind of make sense. So you didn't storyboard it then? No. No, just went with the <laughs> no. shot list. Okay. I already shot listed. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you have, to, you have to shot list it just so people know how, roughly how many shots there are and stuff. Yeah. But we kind of we kind of made it up as we went along, um, and I do it again. I would do it again because hmm. it, it keeps everything fresh. And I, I I I think if you shot list things, then they come out looking a bit shot listed. You didn't find that like at the end of the shoot or the end of the day, you were like, oh crap, we missed that shot, or yeah, did you... yeah, a bit, yeah, okay. <laughs> a bit. And, uh, and our continuity person was fresh. I was still in college, so they weren't that experienced. Mm. So we, I did have a fun day in Edison when the entire first scene, now let me get this right. Yeah, the entire first scene in the lift, which is 20 pages, we had no mid-shot or close-up of one of the characters. <laughs> uh, but obviously, we had him in the wide shot, and we had him in like a three shot, uh, but we had no close-up on this actor. Um, don't know how that happened. So what I did was I just took, because they're all in the lift, they have the same walls behind them. So I took footage from another scene popped it in uh and overlaid different audio obviously not when he's talking because he had good reaction shots and uh, nobody notices but um hmm. uh yeah there were the odd time where something's okay. missing. so you used reaction shots from another scene it placed him into that scene and then threw some audio in there when he was off not actually exactly. on yeah that makes sense that's a good yeah. way to get around that <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not per- it's, it's not perfect but uh but it, but it works, you know. Oh, that's good. That's uh, you know filmmaking. Uh, that's creative filmmaking. That's it. it, 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 it it's problem solving. You know, uh, it was not. It was not a smooth shoot. I mean, it was relatively smooth the first few days. Uh, when we got to the, in fact, the last two days. No, the second and third last day uh, were the two days in the lift, and I didn't really enjoy those days that much because mm. the continuity, six people in a short space, eye lines. Uh, you, you know, did we get this? Do we get his reaction to that line? Seventy percent of the movie you've seen it is in the lift, mm-hmm. and the set because of the mix up the day before hadn't been repainted. Uh, they, so the set designer, um, the set designer had gone home and, and had left the the assistant set person there, and he was like, "Oh, I can spray it now," <laughs> and he goes to spray the back wall and just leaves a huge black blob on the back wall and i could just see everyone's expression because we we had shot seven days up to that point and everything looked really good and we had a really good camera and really good locations um and they just came in and they saw the lift and they were like oh you know <laughs> <laughs> you know um and i was so worried and so was keelan the writer uh through the whole of pre-production that the if the lift doesn't look convincing if it doesn't look good the whole film will die it's just going to die on its, you know. Um, so yeah, if, if you can watch the film and tell that it's not taking place in an actual lift, then that's yeah. going to basically take the audience out of it. Yeah. So that first day, we were all a bit depressed. <laughs> and we shot, we, we had to go ahead and shoot. Um, and we shot and we had that horrible black blob on the back wall. I, I came in the second day when we were doing it. And me and the DOP had the same idea. Okay, we're going to shoot. First of all, the shots need to be more interesting. And second of all, we need to shoot it so the back wall's out of focus as much as possible. (laughs) The problem was all the wide shots have been shot. So what we did in in post-production, and this added another expense to the film, we got someone to paint over the walls. Oh, wow. That's, In the wide shots. I don't think I've told you this. No, Um, uh huh? uh, So all the black bits in the wall, and we had to, you know, put out a bit and put it over the black blob. So it added countless CGI shots, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So did they have to do? Did they have to do that frame by frame? 
like, I don't know. I'm curious, uh, like, I'm thinking of the technical aspect of how that would be done. I hope not. <laughs> uh, you can super, well, for the blob, you can, it's quite easy. You can superimpose because the center of the back wall was the black bit. And mm -hmm. then you had a design either side and the blob kind of over, overlaid to the side. So you could take a bit from this and, and pop it over the blob. But for the black that was faded and didn't look great. So uh, it was a mixture of grading and painting over the back. Okay. Uh, with <laughs> yeah, like it I can imagine, great. like it looks like a proper lift. Yeah, because I don't. Uh, yeah, I was as you were telling that story, I was like, I don't remember there being a black blob in the when I when I you know it didn't stand <laughs> out when not, I watched it. So. <laughs> I can show you. I must show you someday. I can show you the um the original footage. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Actually, I'll send you still later. Oh, the, that'd be cool. Ungraded lift and then the finished lift. Yeah, the difference is night and day it, it, it's one of those things that people don't realize how much good work in post makes a film like color grading and all that kind of stuff uh, i think a lot of uh newer and smaller filmmakers don't save the money for that in their project or spend the time on it that they should you know and so they're like okay we're all done now we got to you know, deadline to submit it to this festival. So we're not going to spend that much time on that. And this is a primary example of why you take your time and get that kind of stuff done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. The film, the film comes together in, in post-production, mm -hmm. you know, you get it. What's the expression? You get a second chance of making the film. Yeah. If you spend the time on it and do it yeah. right. Like I've got a, a, a short that I shot here last fall and there's a few things with it that, that, that we're having problems with in post. And it's that kind of that same scenario. Had it's just been a total pain in the ass to the point where I'm almost to the point of like, you know what, fuck it, let's just put it on YouTube and move on to the next thing, and not even bother with doing anything else with it. It it's really it's really filmmaking is a marathon. You know, yeah. it's really yeah. There are times you just like fuck it, it's it's done, but it's not done. It yeah. takes a lot. It takes a long time. And then, you know, that's why you can't be making a feature film every year because it just, it drains you. All right. So let's get into teaching then. What made you want to become an acting instructor? Well, you, you know, I, I did drama for 10 years. You know, I started when I was seven and I did drama for speech and drama till I was 17. And then you can go on, you can do, you do your grades up to grade eight. And then you can go on to do an acting or a teaching diploma uh, with they're UK colleges, but they fly over to Ireland for the exam. So I, at that stage, had no interest in being an actor. So I went with the teaching. Sorry, can I just interrupt there? Why was why was that? Like, if you studied acting, why wouldn't you want to be an actor? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, because I, I, because I, even when, even at that age, when we were doing shows, you, you know, for the parents and stuff, and I was acting in them, I enjoyed the acting. But I always was like, ooh, you know, could I direct a scene to the teacher? Or, you know, she had a teacher meeting, parent-teacher meeting at one stage, and she said to my parents, um, oh, Connor's a good actor, but what makes him different to everyone else in the class is, is his part might go fine, but if something with the show goes wrong, he'll be upset about it. You know, so he's always looking at the, at the overall picture. Um, so may, maybe he'll be a director. I, I just lent myself, you know, I just started leaning towards directing. And then in the latter years, when I was a teenager, they let me, I was the only one in the class, they let, you know, direct scenes and stuff. And I just found, I found that more enjoyable um, putting on the shows instead of being in them. And um, I mean, I'll still, I'll still throw myself into a role if someone gets sick or, you know, um, and I have to, but I'm rusty. I'm rusty as hell now. For me, it's more exciting putting on the show or, or directing the film, uh, looking at all the aspects instead of just acting. But again, you, like, you, but like we were saying, that ties into hopefully people say I'm a good director, uh, that I have done acting and I appreciate how difficult acting is so I can work well with actors. Um, and then the teaching, the teaching I started actually in the school I trained, they offered me a job doing actually film classes first. I just loved it. I just absolutely loved it. Didn't didn't even see it as a job. And then I, I took on more jobs in other schools. And then about four years ago, I set up stage screen classes, which is my own school. And still to this day, I, I don't I don't consider it a job. I mean, it, it is a job and I get paid for it. Um, but I, I look forward to it every day. 
I'm extremely, extremely lucky. Do you teach a specific style of performing? Like, I know everybody's all into Meisner nowadays, or... I like Meisner. I, I do. I, I find him useful. I, I studied Meisner in college when I was in film college. But um, no, because every, every actor works very differently. So I don't think it's helpful just teaching one style. The whole ethos behind stage screen was stage and screen. And it's 50% each in the kids, the teens and the adult courses. We do both. And I think it's important. And most places, there's a lot of great schools in Dublin, Bow Street and places like that. But they focus on acting to camera or most places for kids focus on acting for stage. And, you know, it's very different. Oh, yeah. When I audition kids in particular, teenagers in particular, when they come from drama schools, I know all the drama schools and they send their kids for an audition like for Lyft. But they're too theatrical. You know, they're great on stage, but they just can't rein it in uh, because they just haven't been trained. So I just thought it was really important to, you know, the kids and teen course is called Stage Screen 5050. And they cover it, they act to camera and they act on stage. And I think that's really, really important. Do you start with one and then go to the other? Like, so do you start with like stage and then switch to camera or vice versa? No, I mix it. I mix it. You mix it. Okay. So like today we'll be working on, on stage stuff. Tomorrow we'll be working on screen stuff. Yeah, mixture. But they they also they also the kids and teenagers they also shoot films. Okay. So we do a bit of script writing and directing as well. So they um they really it, it's quite compact. They really they do a lot. So you know they prepare performances, showcases, and uh, and fesh Matthew. That's the stage part. But then they also they also write and direct and act in short films. So, um, and then, you know, when it comes to our showcases, we show those films in addition to like the short plays that they do. So someone who might not be, in fact, I had one guy, Shane, who I think it was the very first year I was doing it. He was, e- he wanted to do the course and he was emailing me during the summer and he was really nervous about the act inside because he just wanted to do it like camera and direct. And he kept messaging me, you know, oh, you, you know, I, I don't want to do the acting side of things. I just want to, I just want to direct um, and do camera. And at that stage, these days I'd say, well, you have to do everything. But at that stage, I was trying to get students. So I was like, yeah, that's fine. And he did act, he, 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 you know, slowly but surely he got into the acting side of things. And I actually had Keelan, you know, Keelan. Um, mm-hmm. He came in to do a script class with them. And I showed him a film, or I think we shot a, a scene and he turned around to me at the end and said, that Shane guy is brilliant on camera. And this, this was the guy who didn't want to do acting originally. So, but again, you know, try the acting. If you want to direct, you know, you should be able to understand acting uh, if you want to work with actors. So, uh, so they get to try everything and some students gravitate towards camera, some for the acting. So it's good to try all the aspects. Oh, absolutely. When you're working with the students, do you kind of look to see maybe where they gravitate or where they are a little better? So like maybe this person obviously has a talent for the performing and like, you know, you kind of encourage them to go that way versus like you know, they're up there and you're like, you will never be famous and maybe encourage them towards something else. I don't like the you'll never be famous. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I actually get a few messages um, on Facebook. I got a really funny one about a month ago from an adult looking for classes and she said i want to be in fair city that that, that was that was like her opening line I, I want to be a famous actor and be in fair city i i, I was so fed up I, I was tempted not to reply i was like you're going about this the wrong way you don't go into acting wanting to be famous or if you do you, you, you know famous or rich or if you do you're not in it for the right reasons yeah you do it for the enjoyment so I do send the kids for, uh, and the adults for auditions, but I wouldn't s- strongly insist on, you know, sending it out as a career. Um, in fact, my thing has always been diversify. So you do want to go into the performing arts and you do want to be an actor. Take dance classes, take singing classes, host a podcast, you know. Uh, try That's my direct- model. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, direct script right you know the ac- actors who can write their own material and not be waiting by the phone you know so that's always been my what i tell people oh i totally agree with that too um yeah well you know claire milan yeah so i i had her on this podcast and that's her philosophy too is like you know she, she wants she creates a lot of roles for herself 
and will write her own scripts and stuff and and whether it be on screen or on stage and i think that's absolutely what you need to do you can't just rely on one thing because the odds on you making a career as a performer are so hard and so rare Tiny. yeah that that you need something else and it's not even that you need something else it's good for you like to yeah. have something else it all ties in with each other you know if you're a good script writer that will help your act and you know mm -hmm. understanding about characters and stuff so it all it all helps each other and stops you being on the dole for the rest of your life yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> how long how long is your course well they do they it, well, there's a few courses. Uh, they oh, okay. do. So it varies depending on what people want to yeah. do. Okay. G generally speaking, the main courses are are ten week terms, um, and there's three terms over the academic year. There's shorter courses like the filmmaking for adults course, uh, which is seven weeks. So uh, so it varies. Okay. Do you get a decent amount of adults wanting? Because because this is I, where I can see a lot of adults getting involved in is if you know they kind of went out they. They did their job career thing that they kind of always yep. had in the back of their mind, like I wanted to do this, and you know, and so now maybe they 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 are kind of taking the time to actually do something they've always wanted to do and always wanted to learn about. Interestingly enough, um, I've had a lot of interest in the filmmaking for adults course, which <laughs> which I thought wouldn't get that much interest. That's just people, and actually, a lot some who have done acting who would like to try script writing or the other side of things so that's what i'm finding i'm finding people even people i know who are actors wanting to do this course to try the other side of things which i think is fantastic yeah it is with the students are there varying experience levels not just in the sense of maybe actors that want to try like uh, directing or whatever but um because i i think of like a lot of more experienced actors might like like to do classes and workshops just to kind of keep honing their skills refresher courses yeah yeah so do you do you have like different levels then like you know starting students yeah, yeah. i mean the kids whatever level they're welcome to join um but the adults like the diploma course they have to audition for okay so they do have to come in and do a piece to, uh, to get in yeah yeah well we'll be doing it on zoom now over the next few weeks um <laughs> for the autumn but um yeah they prepare a monologue and just because they need to have a bit of experience um and then if they if I don't think they're quite ready, then I suggest they do the mixed level class for a year and then go on to diploma level. Has it been harder auditioning people online over Zoom versus in person? It's not too bad. It's yeah. not too bad. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. Um, how do you balance your time then between filmmaking, you know, directing films and teaching? Ah, sure. There's 24 hours in a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I do classes in the autumn now. We'll be doing class Saturday is for kids and teens. I'm going to start a Sunday class for younger students. The adult courses are just Tuesday, Wednesday evenings, and then we do musical theater on Friday evenings. But I have other tutors for that, but I I, I tend to be there anyway. And um, and then the the smaller courses, um, like the filmmaking courses, run just periodically throughout the year, and we also do. I also facilitate workshops with Louise Kylie Caston. We do that two, three times a year. And yeah, and that, uh, mo I mean, most of them are the weekend uh, and evenings. So that leaves me days, you know, to work on scripts and film stuff. Okay. Are you working on something right now? Yeah, I'm really, I'm, fe I'm feeling fired up at the moment. Because um, uh, I, I, I shot Lyft in 2015. So it's been five years. Mm -hmm. So it's time to, it's time to do another film. Uh, it wasn't finished in 15, but, you know, it's been five years since I've been on a set. Especially during the pandemic, actually, I've been sitting around um, and I've been feeling fired up that once COVID has died down, I, I'm definitely going to shoot the next feature. And I have three three ideas at the moment: uh, two horror films and a musical, oh, which really? is an adaptation. Yeah, which is an adaptation of a musical. Um, that I haven't quite got the rights from the person yet. I can't talk to her during the pandemic because her phone is broken. So I'm waiting to meet her uh I, uh about that so um i i really want to do that one next because i think it will stick out i think the thing is if you're trying to make a name for yourself i think lift i think lift is a good film i think it's quirky but i don't think it's different enough to make a splash if you get me yeah i think 
I think everyone who's seen it loves it, genuinely loves it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really well put together film and it's, it's done great things for everybody's career. But I think in, in terms of internationally making a splash, you got to do something a bit different. So like the horror film would be a lot easier to do, but everybody's doing horror films. You know, and I love horror films, uh, and it doesn't matter if they're crap or brilliant. Uh, horror fans are the most loyal fans; they'll, they'll watch it anyway, even if it's a, a terrible. Um, but it, will it make a name for myself and everyone involved? So I was having a conversation, Killian McAvoy. Do you know Killian? I don't know if you did, but um, familiar, yeah, yeah. So uh, I recorded a, a podcast with him. Uh, it hasn't gone live yet, but it'll be going online before yours does. Or before this one yep. and we had quite a long conversation about horror films and how different countries do like you know asian horror films versus like american horror films for example and kind of one of the things that i felt especially in my time living in ireland is it seemed like a lot of irish horror films just kind of copy the american system which kind of to your point doesn't make it stand out what came out a couple of years ago the hole in the ground that was an Irish oh, yeah. film, um, but it wasn't. It didn't stand out in any way, uh, in my opinion. I don't know if you, you liked it or if other people liked it, but just in my opinion, it was just like, eh, mm. it, it didn't really By do anything numbers. for me. Hmm? By the numbers, kind of. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And, um, and yeah, if you're going to make a horror film, you definitely need to stand out in a certain way. So. Or just do a musical. <laughs> or do a musical. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gosh, not a lot of people are doing musicals. No. No, nobody's doing uh, in Ireland. Nobody's doing musicals. Yeah. I mean, you had once, I suppose, which was a good few years ago. But that was a film board funded film. You know, how many independent filmmakers do a musical? None. None. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so I know this person who has a musical, uh, which is done well, which is played off off Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm going to talk to her. I hope she doesn't hear this before I actually talk to her. Um, <laughs> just just trouble, make sure but... she doesn't listen to the podcast. Yeah, exactly. No, it could, yeah, it could be anyone I'm talking about. I haven't said the name. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm really hoping I can convince her to, I mean, it's her baby, but I think it would make a fantastic film and be okay. something very different. As a, as a teacher, how do you keep training yourself like uh, in, in a filmmaker? What do you do to keep it yourself learning something new? I mean, that's a great question. Um, really, I find, you know, if it's been a couple of years since I've done a film, uh, how do you keep the creativity going? Really watching the students because they come up with great stuff, you know, and that kind of spurs on your sort of creativity. I have to write scripts anyway for the classes anyway. Um, but sometimes they'll come up with a script with, with a brilliant idea or whatever. So, you know, it all feeds into my, my creativity. I, I get inspired by the students just as much as vice versa, hopefully. Oh, nice. All right. Well, we're probably good time to wrap up then. Lovely. Anyone listening, be sure to check out The Lift. It is available just lift. on The Lift. Just Lift. Just lift. lift. Not The Lift. That's right. Lift. There is a film called there The Lift. The yeah, we had this conversation before. They actually... we did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, so. yeah. Lift, not The Lift. That's right. Just Lift. Look up lift by Carter armstrong sanfrey that is the one to watch and uh, if you'd like to find out about his acting classes you can go to stages screen class stages screen classes stage screen classes stage screen, <laughs> stage screen classes you're fired milo <laughs> dot com. Man, <laughs> ugh, totally stage screen classes dot com. stage screen classes dot com I will put the link uh, in the show notes so people don't have to worry about not understanding me. They can just click on the link. Fantastic. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. This was uh, actually a really interesting discussion. Like I said, I, I, I've really been enjoyed doing this podcast from because I always learned so much, just kind of how we were just talking about with learning from just people that you're working with or doing stuff with, uh, just listening to people. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, in this me. it, yeah, in this industry, nobody knows everything. Mm -hmm. he, he, even someone as successful as Steven Spielberg says he learns every day. So, you know, we're all learning every day and we'll all get better. Good advice to end it on. We're learning Thank every you. day. We'll all get better. <laughs> Jeez, it's a bit sappy, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Not too late now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Connor. I appreciate it. Bye.